anyway. So I want to say something about um, anonymous arguments. Uh, I mean, there is a broader issue to do with anonymity, um, but uh, the rights and wrongs of anonymity, which attracts a, a wide range of interest, I'm not going to uh, go into all of the aspects of that. I want to look specifically at how this impacts argumentation. Uh, so that's you know, narrow my focus a bit, even though obviously there's a wider conversation about particularly uh, anonymity online, um, obviously has relevance to some of the things I want to talk about. So here's the sort of general structure of what I want to say. Uh, so I want to give some start with some examples. Uh, firstly, of a couple of uh, recent uh, cases of arguments that uh, quite, uh, cases where the anonymity of arguments raised. Uh, uh, these are arguments about arguments. So there were arguments about some uh, uh, putatively anonymous arguments um, that attracted attention over the last year or so. And now I want to suggest that this is there's nothing new here, and that this is actually a, a debate that's been going on for a very long time by looking at some earlier uh, discussion of these issues and summarize some of the the recurring uh, um, uh, cases that have been made for and against uh, permitting or encouraging anonymity by arguers. Uh, having set out those, uh, those examples, I'll then say a little bit more about how we might think about defining anonymity. I'm not proposing to say anything original here. This is all based on, on other people's work. As I said, there's a, a larger debate over the nature of anonymity. And from there, I'm going to address a couple of more specific issues related to, to uh, argumentation, one of them to do with uh, more sort of common approaches to argument evaluation, one of them specifically to do with uh, virtue theories of argumentation, which obviously, is, as Kat just pointed out, um, I, have, I have a skin in the game uh, when it comes to uh, virtue approaches, uh, and then and I hope to draw some conclusions from all that. So uh, here's my, um, so, well, first of all, looking at the recent arguments, here's my first of these, these cases. Uh, so this was something that blew up last year. I don't know how many people have come across uh, Scott Alexander. Uh, he is a, a re relatively well-known blogger. Um, he actually, well, he has a, an interest in philosophy, amongst other things. I think his undergrad degree was in philosophy, but he's actually uh, a professional psychiatrist. He works as a psychiatrist in California, um, but he also is extraordinarily prolific as a, as a blogger. It's sort of millions of words that he's produced over the last decade or so. Um, and he's he's a good writer. I mean, I suppose you, could, you write, you do that much writing, you better get good at it. Uh, and he uh, he, he is uh, um, he uh, reads well, and he's quite you know, he he is influential in some circles, perhaps. Uh, so he had a, a a run in with the New York Times last year because the New York Times wanted to run a profile on him, which was I suppose flattering in a sense. Um, but they wanted to run, run it with his full name. Now, Scott Alexander is a uh, pseudonym. Um, it's actually his first and middle name. He leaves off the surname. So I mean, he's a practicing psychiatrist, so he uses the surname in his medical practice. He doesn't uh, uh, use it uh, for the blog. Um, I mean, he, I think the story is he started off using his full name, and then, then he, uh, when he was very early in his career as a psychiatrist at that point, and then he, he was interviewing for jobs and people would ask him pointed questions about his blog and whether this was meant that he wasn't really serious about medicine. And so he lost out in a few jobs and decided that he needed to separate these things. And there's also a broader point uh, about, you know, he doesn't want these patients to Google him and find his blog, um, not because there's anything necessarily bad about it, but because he wants them to be talking about their problems rather than his. Uh, so, uh, so he was hoping to keep the things apart as the blog became more um, uh, uh, prominent and more uh, widely discussed. This gets harder to do. Obviously, if the New York Times runs a profile of him using his full name, then that's going to be the first thing that anyone finds when they Google him. Uh, basically, forever and a day, the New York Times is going to you know score highly in any Google rank. So that uh, was his concern. Um, he reacted to this by actually taking the blog down altogether and complaining that the New York Times was trying to dox him, which was maybe something of an overreaction, um, but it created a whole big uh, online um, drama. Um, eventually, uh, he came back with the blog this year, having resigned from his initial group practice and started out in, in, in his own psychiatric practice and also 
having moved the blog to a platform where he can more easily make an income from it. So he's now doing quite well. Uh, but he had this sort of panicky moment last year when he was afraid that the New York Times was trying to dox him. Uh, so anyway, his, he wrote up in the new blog um, uh, so what, what happened, described his version of events. So as he said, well, you, you had information coming to him from various people, including several people at the New York Times. He wrote to him with, I think, apparently mutually inconsistent descriptions of what was going on behind the scenes, but still uh, they were debating over whether or not he should be given anonymity. There were some concerns that some circumstances where the New York Times I mean, there is certainly inconsistency in that how the Times handles this. There are other cases where they gave anonymity to people, uh, but they were reluctant to do it in his case. And there was apparently a debate going on about all this. Um, so anyway, his take, the main sort of bit that I'm lifting from this is he says, well, in the Times' worldview, they start with the right to dox me, and I had to earn the right to remain anonymous by proving I'm the perfect sympathetic victim who satisfies all their criteria of victimhood. But in my worldview, I start with the right to anonymity. They need to make an affirmative case for doxing me. But obviously, there could be uh, you know, reasons for an expose, but, but that wasn't really what the Times said they were doing. Uh, they just thought he was interesting. They didn't think he was villainous. Um, so, so why should they have to include his, his full name? Um, so he's, his uh, presentation of this is that he has a, um, a right to, a presumptive right to his own anonymity. Will Wilkinson, who is a, another um, online journalist, uh, responded to this by uh, challenging this idea of a basic right to pseudonymity. Um, and well, he's, his point is, well, you know, you allow that kind of thing, then it sort of corrodes the standards of public discourse. Um, undermines norms of freedom, equality, dignity, mutual respect if everyone can, can engage anonymously then you know it's it's the wild west basically is is what he's saying with all this um he then sort of transitions to i think a a, a point that's that that alexander might concede or might happily accept which is that uh, it's warranted to regard pseudonymous authors with suspicion that you might reasonably treat a pseudonymous argument uh, i mean I, I, the reason i'm i'm focusing on this case in particular is one of the things that makes uh, Alexander interesting as a blog is that it is argumentative. He's making a case for various different positions. He's not just describing things, he's arguing for conclusions. But yes, you might reasonably uh, uh, assign less credence to some of his arguments because you don't know who he is. Um, and if you did know who he was, if you had some sense of his reputation, then perhaps you'd assign a higher credence. And that seems reasonable, but that seems like a trade-off that Alexander was happy to make. He didn't, he was prepared to be taken less seriously as a blogger in return for still having his practice as a psychiatrist. I mean, eventually he found a way of keeping both, but it involved significant additional effort on his part. He had to become a sole practitioner as a psychiatrist. Um, so so it, it, at least the bit that I've created here, there's not actually uh, an inconsistency there with what Alexander was saying. Anyway, that's one example. We'll come back to it. I want to move on to another, perhaps more familiar, higher profile example. So the Journal of Controversial Ideas, so this was floated um, a few years ago. Uh, it actually published its first issue earlier this year. It took a while for the first issue to appear, as is often the case with new journals. Um, so it has uh, uh, two very well-known uh, uh, philosophers on the editorial board, or the, or amongst the executive editors, uh, Peter Singer and Jeff McMahon. Um, uh, Francesca Minerva, also a reasonably well-known philosopher, well-known in particular for uh, a nasty incident where she was attacked um, by various people um, for uh, online and in other ways. She received death threats on the basis of an article that she published. So, um, uh, so the one the distinctive feature of the Journal of Controversial Ideas, one that's attracted most of the attention, is the fact that they permit pseudonymous uh, uh, authorship. I mean, I think some other journals have done this in the past. There are examples of, uh, of articles that have been published pseudonymously in well-known philosophy journals. Um, so some people may have come across the fact that, yes, I think it was it David Lewis who published an article under the pseudonym Bruce Le Cat, uh, which was Bruce being the name of his cat. Um, but uh, I think that was in the Australasian Journal of Philosophy. But that's not a kind of, it's not a, maybe that's only a service extended to David Lewis. Um, but uh, Journal of Controversial Ideas makes this you know, part of, the, uh, of their, their mission statement that they will do this. Having said that, they don't encourage it. And their first and so far only issue has 10, 10 articles. Uh, seven of them are not pseudonymous. So there's only three pseudonymous articles published uh, uh, so far. And they do label, they give them made up names and they allow you to make up your own name, but they 
uh, but they label them as pseudonymous, so you can tell which one's which. Um, but they uh, permit people to publish, if necessary, under a pseudonym. And that the argument they make for this uh, is, is what I've created here, um, that you know, people shouldn't have to put their career or physical mental security at risk. Intellectual and moral progress should not require heroes or martyrs. Uh, the counterpoint, now they've certainly received quite a lot of pushback uh, from a variety of, of, uh, of sources. Uh, Patrick Stokes, who's a, uh, an Australian philosopher at Deakin University, uh, I think has one of the more sort of extended responses to this. Um, so his, uh, his take on all this uh, is that basically he thinks this is, uh, this is irresponsible. Um, uh, speaking, writing and publishing are actions, uh, all subject to moral evaluation like any other action. Um, uh, so, uh, that, so he makes this point that you know, publishing any sort of article grants it some sort of authority which has downstream consequences it can feed into, um, say, for example, uh, it with the way issues of uh, race and gender are discussed in the broader society. Um, so uh, using a pseudonym might protect you from being blamed from the effects, but it doesn't change your responsibility for them. Um, so, uh, I mean, he seems to be, he is, I believe, opposed to uh, pseudonymous publication. Having said that, um, I mean, yes, well, well I, I, again, I won't um, pause to, to, to turn into the details of this too much, but um, but he's suggesting that ultimately that pseudonymous publication is, uh, uh, is irresponsible. So I want to sort of situate this in a more historical context um, and look at some of the, the backstory. And some of these arguments have actually been going on for a very long time. So, well, this is a very, very long time. This is, this is a deep backstory, which is made a little bit relevant to this. Uh, so at least in English law, uh, there's a few br brief interludes when it has actually been illegal uh, to publish things anonymously, but it's seldom the case. Uh, so there is a royal proclamation in 1546, apparently, uh, which forbade anonymous publication. So every book should bear the author's and the printer's name. Uh, notice the, yeah, the author's and the printer's, uh, the, the bit about the author's name didn't stick, but the bit about the printer's name did. So there was a period of a, several centuries when uh, printers were obliged to, to, to attach their name to published work. Um, that stuck until the 19th century, more or less without interruption. The author's name bit, on the other hand, doesn't, doesn't hang around long. Uh, by the 1550s, so a decade or so after that proclamation, it seems to be ignored, uh, as according to this, this summary. Uh, it comes back again with a Star Chamber decree in 1637. Um, so not really, not a high point of, of British liberal thought, really. Uh, but then um, it, that, that in turn um, is, uh, uh, is struck down after the restoration with the Licensing Act of 1662, which again, still keeps the bit about the printers, uh, but not the, not the author. Uh, so after 1662, no subsequent requirement in English law that an author uh, give their name, uh, but the printer's name was always attached. And there are plenty of cases uh, right through the uh, 18th and into the 19th century where printers get, uh, you know, that the author uh, manages to, to escape scot-free while the printer ends up in the pillory with people throwing rotten veg at him. Uh, so the printers were held accountable, uh, but authors were, were not necessarily. There was no explicit prohibition of, of uh, anonymous authorship. Different story in some other uh, uh, jurisdictions, of course, in particular, uh, the French under Napoleon III, I think, passed a law in the middle of the 19th century forbidding anonymous authorship. Uh, that in turn seems to have had uh, a sort of a knock-on um, uh, intellectual influence in England that people started talking about it in the English press more than they had done. Not least because by that point, the convention in, uh, as, as the sort of the popular press, the journalistic press emerged in the 18th and 19th centuries in, in England, it mostly is anonymous. Uh, that there's a lot of, of anonymous journalism or, or journalism under, under more or less transparent pseudonyms. Uh, so actually using your, your name was, I think, was in some respects, this is mostly a matter of fashion, um, but you find a, a lot of things that are written under, uh, you think about The Spectator, for example, um, the, the original Spectator from the, the first or second decade of the 18th century, uh, it's written as The Spectator. We know it's Addison Steele and some of their friends, they actually had a little letter at the end of each item. You can check now, we know, I'm not sure how, how common knowledge this was in, at the time that the spectator was first appearing, but we now know that how, we now know the code that each letter stands for one of the, the particular authors. So you can decipher it and work out who the author of these pieces were. Um, 
And people, I mean, for as long as this has been going on, people have been complaining about it. This is a, a more or less random example uh, from one Louis Alexander Dugar, who was at this point, I think, a, a fairly young doctor, but he went on to be a uh, sort of fairly prominent figure in, in, um, in uh, he founded one of the state of Georgia's leading medical schools, I think, well, so Wikipedia informs me. Um, but he's complaining here in letters, the editor of a, of a medical journal, 1833, um, as a subscriber to your valuable periodicals, let, permit me to take the liberty of inquiring who are the authors of the several highly interesting communications over the signatures of Senex, et cetera, et cetera. Frequent appearance of anonymous productions um, uh, must, unless the liberty I now request be granted, materially tend to diminish its value. Uh, so his concern is that, you know, that these things are, are less persuasive because they don't have uh, uh, authority attached to them. There's no names attached to them. Senex, of course, means old man, but uh, well, it's venerable old man, perhaps, or something like that, uh, if it's a positive um, uh, epithet. So, um, uh, amusing sidebar that the, uh, so, well, I, 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 I'm unable to resist the sidebar that Senex was also the pseudonym used uh, uh, more than a century after this by Tommy Lascelles, who was the uh, personal secretary to King George VI in writing a, a letter to the Times, which is considered to be, or was considered until fairly recently, to comprise a, uh, a relatively important component of the British constitution. Uh, so one of the idiosyncrasies of Britain's unwritten constitution is that it's, well, it's not that it's not written at all, it's just not all written in one place, and it's bits and pieces of it, bits and pieces of it turn up all over the place, including anonymous letters to the Times. Uh, so this was a, a response to a debate over whether uh, what circumstances the king might decline a request from, from the prime minister uh, to call a general election. Uh, and the response was an anonymous letter in the Times under the, written from Senex, whoever Senex was, but understood by people in the know uh, to, uh, to actually be Tommy Lascelles, who was the secretary of the king and therefore representing the king's opinion on this. Um, so, uh, so even as that was 1950, so even much long after 1833, uh, as it happens, the same pseudonym, but pseudonyms are still being used um, in, in letters to uh, public uh, publications. Uh, here's the editor's response to all this, uh, and well, broadly speaking, agreeing with him um, and saying, well, uh, that you know that they do actually require that the that at least the editor knows who the uh, um, who the author of these things these uh, communications are, especially if there if there's any kind of important medical information in them. Um, here's uh, a more substantive intervention uh, by John Morley, major 19th century journalist, writing in the Fortnightly Review, of which he was the editor. Uh, a piece uh, against anonymous uh, journalism. He discusses a whole range of arguments for pro and con, but his main uh, argument against the gigantic uh, uh, objection against the present system, which is still at this point, middle years of the 19th century, the dominant model of journalism, uh, that, uh, that, that, that these things are, that journalistic publication is anonymous. Uh, the gigantic objection is, um, is basically uh, that, that it's irresponsible again. The immeasurably momentous task of forming national opinion is entrusted to men who are, as a body, wholly irresponsible, uh, that nobody knows who they are and they're not being held to account. Um, but, but that's, I mean, that's part of an ongoing debate which lasts for some time. Um, so that's 1867. The Fortnightly Review has adopted a policy of signing all its articles. But uh, so here is uh, a George Binney Dibley who uh, was uh, a, a senior figure at the Manchester Guardian, as it then was in the 19th century, and went on to be, he was also he was an economist, and went on to be, I think, a fellow of All Sales College, Oxford. But he uh, wrote a, a popular book on the, uh, on the around newspapers' work, and he's defending anonymous journalism. Uh, so this is you know, decades after um, that last piece. Um, anonymous journalism has been found in the end to be a more powerful political weapon, partly because reverence attaches itself more easily to the unknown also because the shelter of corporate responsibility adds somewhat to the freedom of writing, very much the fertility of invention. And he sort of expands on that a bit. A bit. There is a further advantage of the journalist in anonymity. It's a very effective shelter under which he can do his daily round of ordinary work without the natural slackening and the painful fits and starts which pursue inevitably the responsible writer who has to put his name to everything he produces. I think the general gist of this is that you don't, you, 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 it, it's easier to write if you don't need to worry about being held to account for it afterwards. You, if all else fails, you can blame your colleagues for your worst columns. Um, it seems perhaps not the most admirable uh, reason for, for preferring it, but at least it gets the work done. Um, and, uh, and this is, well, this is from an article that came out this year, 
uh, reflecting on the Economist, on the history of the Economist, which of course the Economist is still anonymous. Uh, basically, everything in the Economist is. I think again, it's not difficult to work out who most of these people are. I think the, the web page in particular gives you a lot of information, or their Twitter feeds usually do. But but still, in the actual print publication of the Economist, they don't sign their their, their pieces. They they do have uh, some sort of standard uh, uh, pseudonyms which are used for some 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 of the columns, but they're not they're not giving the names of the actual journalists. Uh, so uh, and the the one defence that the Economist offers for this is yes, editorial consistency. Corporate signature of the magazine avoids the vices, limitations, and temptations that can be derived from personal bylines. I think the, apparently the only other British publication, at least, that still sticks to mostly anonymous bylines would be Private Eye, but that's for other reasons. Um, although, again, it's not difficult to work out who, who people are, but they're, they're, not, they're not officially giving their name. Um, and, well, of course, a, a, a sideline here, not so much here addressing argumentation as such, but, but other well-known examples of anonymous authorship. Obviously, um, Bertrand Russell's example of the author of Waverley. Uh, so, um, so uh, Walter Scott published uh, Waverley novels. Uh, uh, well, Waverley he published anonymously. There's the uh, the title page of, of Waverley, and the first of it, so the first sequel, uh, Guy Mannering, was published by the author of Waverley, as were the subsequent uh, Waverley uh, novels. A couple of dozen of them total, I think. Um, I, I think Scott's excuse to begin with, at least, was uh, that he had a still had a legal practice. Um, he was, I think, uh, 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 aspiring. He was the thought that he might one day become a judge, and being a popular novelist would perhaps count against his, his dignity of the uh, of his office. Um, uh, but I mean, he had published other stuff. Uh, he published verse and, and nonfiction under his own name already. I think also perhaps he was concerned that it's that he would trivialize his literary reputation for the other sort of the more the stuff which now nobody remembers, but still the, the stuff which at that time he thought of as the more serious work. Um, or another even perhaps more straightforward example, again, not necessarily argumentative, but a clear example of where someone's professional commitments uh, forced them into anonymity. James Herriot uh, of All Creatures Great and Small fame, actual name Alf White, um, because the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons at least 50 years ago when Herriot started writing, uh, regarded this as advertising. So or at least the fear was that it would be seen as advertising. I'm not sure whether he ever really checked with them or he was just uh, uh, an abundant, uh, exercising an abundance of caution. But um, uh, so uh, uh, he used this pseudonym. James, the, the original James Herriot, I believe, was actually uh, a Scottish soccer player that he got the name from. Um, but uh, so he was practicing, he carried on really for 20 years after these books started coming and he was a, a best-selling author with a, uh, a TV show um, uh, dramatizing his books. He was still practicing uh, a veterinary medicine uh, in, in Yorkshire it, well into the 1980s, um, but he was practicing as Alf White uh, and, and the books were published as, as James Herriot, so he keeps the two apart, which, I mean, in a sense is, well, taking us back to Scott Alexander, that's more or less what he was saying he wanted to be able to do, uh, to have a, a, a blog uh, as, as Scott Alexander and then a psychiatric practice under, under the, the, the actual name that his, his medical credentials were issued under. Um, so uh, just to, to sum up uh, some of these arguments that we've seen, well, so some of the contra anonymity arguments here that anonymity encourages sexually harmful speech. Obviously, there's a much bigger uh, uh, debate over the harms of particularly online anonymity, not just anonymity with respect to argumentation, but uh, but it includes that in particular. And we see how it intersects with some of that. That's in particular say, the uh, arguments raised against uh, the journal Controversial Ideas, uh, that anonymity reduces authority, which I think is something which which you know, the proponents of anonymous argument may reasonably concede, uh, but it's you know, as, 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 uh, as something that's, uh, uh, that, that perhaps counts against the practice as a whole, but it's something that well, a price that one might be prepared to pay, uh, that anonymity induces uh, irresponsibility, that, uh, that anonymous all, uh, arguments are produced irresponsibly, as opposed to, uh, to ones which somebody gives their name to. And then some of the arguments advanced in favor of uh, anonymous arguments, um, well, the idea, Scott Alexander's idea, that there's a presumptive right uh, to be anonymous if you want to be, uh, that the, the, the people, people making a case that you shouldn't be anonymous are the people who really need to make the, the, the case that the, the onus uh, is on them, uh, that anonymity reduces the personal cost of speech, that it diversifies the range of voices that we hear in public debate because it uh, make, permits um, people to participate in, in public uh, uh, conversations who might otherwise be deterred by the personal costs that they would bear of whatever sort, that if they 
fear that there that certain types of speech, or indeed not just the, the specific voices, but also the specific arguments that are made, uh, if you fear that those arguments come at a, at a high personal cost, well, then that would might very well deter you from making them, which could be uh, uh, to the detriment of the overall debate. Um, the idea that corporate responsibility can exceed uh, personal responsibility, uh, this is we're perhaps on, 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 on uh, thinner ice at this point, but the idea that the uh, that that the, uh, the journalist who speaks on behalf of his paper, that the economist uh, say, you know, when you say the economist argues as follows, that this uh, conveys some level of, of seriousness that just naming some random journalist wouldn't, um, that, uh, that it's an aid to creativity, uh, that it uh, leads to editorial consistency, a common line across multiple uh, voices, uh, and that, as we've seen, that it could be a professional requirement that, uh, uh, well, this perhaps falls back into uh, this point about personal cost, um, but that in, for some professions it might be uh, you might be constrained to uh, argue anonymously or not at all. So, uh, having sort of surveyed some of the debates that have arisen over the, the nature and and uh, the status of anonymous argument, uh, let's uh, now glance a little bit at some of the ways in which anonymity can be defined, some distinctions that can be drawn. Uh, I mean, I, I, as I said earlier, none of this is particularly original. I've got most of this from Grace Patterson and a recent paper of hers, and she in turn has got this from so various other people who've been talking about the definition of anonymity. So, uh, so let's think about a, an anonymized speech act, as she defines it as being one where uh, the audience is intentionally blocked from identifying the speaker, and she goes on to explain what she means by those two terms I've highlighted. So, uh, so identification here uh, is that, uh, well, learning some, I mean, these, these are defined in, in terms that permit uh, great ability, if you like, that they're not an all or nothing affair. Uh, so you uh, learn some specific facts about the, the agent, um, not, not uh, immediately uh, uh, necessarily connected to them, um, or you can be reasonably expected to come to know those facts. And, uh, and a, what she thinks of as a block is anything which makes it more difficult. So not necessarily impossible, but, but harder. So again, the Scott Alexander example is not a bad one. It was always possible to work out what his real name was if you spent, you know, a bird to spend an afternoon poking around uh, in you know, multiple Google searches because, you know, you could see, you could find sort of connections where various people have mentioned it in various places. And he did have some publications under his own name in journals and so on. So it wasn't all that difficult to link these things together. But you had to actually do some digging. It wasn't didn't pop up on the first page of the of um, of the the Google uh, search. So again, it, there was a block to identification, uh, even though the block wasn't uh, wasn't impermeable. Um, and uh, we can also uh, 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 point out which a lot of I mean I've not so far made any real attempt to distinguish anonymity from pseudonymity. Uh, there will be, I will make some use of this distinction, or at least I'll make some use of a special case of pseudonymity. Um, but we can think of pseudonymity as being a sort of a, 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 a well, the way that uh, Grace Patterson thinks of it as a partially or circumstantially anonymized uh, speech act. Uh, so a form of uh, anonymization, um, but one that's not sort of, that's not utterly watertight. Um, and she also has this concept uh, of a communicatively anonymized speech. So one way, basically, where you know that it's anonymized. Um, so that was presumably true in Scott Alexander's case, certainly true with the authors of those three articles in the Journal of Controversial Ideas, because it has a pseudonym written right next to their names uh, on, the, uh, on the, 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 the contents page, and I think on the PDFs of the individual articles. So it's you know, clear to anyone uh, uh, looking at this that these are, are pseudonyms. I suppose someone, a casual reader of Scott Alexander's stuff, might not necessarily notice that that, that, that he wasn't, um, you know, Mrs. Alexander's little boy. Um, but uh, but although Scott and Alexander are his given names, but um, but it's not his full name. Uh, so perhaps that's. I mean, he was really making no secret of it and did discuss it at various points. So it does seem to be an instance of communicative anonymity. Um, but some of these, some other such examples, it might be the case that you just didn't realise. That the uh, anonymous author was uh, genuinely anonymous, um, that may or may not make a material difference. So, uh, so I so I say something a little bit more about a special case of pseudonymity, and this is the idea of an enduring pseudonym. I mean, again, not a particularly original idea. It's being discussed by various people in various cases, various places. Uh, this is uh, uh, from uh, a U.S. Um, 
a, a lawsuit from 30 years ago um, concerning, this was an appeal uh, concerning a man who gave, gave testimony in the uh, court of first instance using a pseudonym um, and the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the defendant who'd been convicted in the original case uh, contested the conviction on the grounds that this guy didn't use his real name. He lost the appeal being on the basis that the witness, well, okay, the witness probably should have said, explained what, he's, what was on his birth certificate, but the witness used the name that he was generally known by. Uh, so it wasn't that he just made up a name on the occasion. Um, it was he used the name which everybody else knew him by. So all the, other, the, the defendant and everyone else involved uh, didn't realize he had another name. So yes, as, as the judge rather grandiloquently puts it, uh, the name under which the witness testified was not some passing cognominal fancy assumed solely for the purpose of the judicial proceeding, bearing no relation to the witness's life outside the courthouse. To the contrary, this was a name the witness had clasped to his bosom and made his own, not some incorporeal apparition, as was his ostensible counterpart in Smith, which is an earlier case where someone was just, just was introduced as Smith for the purposes of giving their testimony and then was never Smith again, um, which I think the courts might accept in some extreme cases, but that really has to be you know, kind of witness protection type situations. It's not, not, not usual, um, but a flesh and blood human being easily placed within his relevant context. Uh, so, so the thought is that there are people who become better known by their pseudonyms who become strongly associated with their pseudonym. So, you know, um, James Herriot was is uh, is a famous author. Alf White is a not so is a not particularly well known uh, 20th century uh, um, Yorkshire uh, uh, veterinary surgeon. Um, but James Herriot is the guy whose you know whose name's on all the books. Um, uh, so you know the, these these enduring names uh, have a have a strong association, uh, and that that's an association to which uh, a character can attach. So well. Bringing this closer, perhaps to more uh, specifically argument-related uh, points, um, so there is a, um, a, a specific issue here to do with evaluation of arguments. That a lot of um, of the sort of standard uh, disc discussions of how arguments should be evaluated uh, presume that we really shouldn't be paying any attention at all uh, to the character. Uh, and personality of the person making the argument. I mean, this is Van Emer and Rotendorf making this sort of point. Um, uh, they make their uh, externalization principle, I think mean, is how they frame this. Um, but uh, lot that this is, I mean, they, they put it in a strong way, but this is not unique or original to them. Uh, it is not the internal reasoning processes and inner convictions of those involved in resolving a difference of opinion that are of primary importance. Um, but the positions these people express or project in their speech acts, instead of concentrating on the psychological dispositions of the language users involved in the resolution process, we concentrate primarily on their commitments as they are externalized in or can be externalized from the discourse of the text. So basically, argument evaluation is all about the text and not about the people. Um, not, it's all about the actual written argument or, or spoken argument, but not about the people making it. Um, uh, here is Dale Hample pushing back against that idea uh, externalization means that only text will be studied, whatever personal and internal processes are involved in argumentative interaction, only the textual evidence of them is analyzed, and it's taken as a suitable synecdoche for what the arguments do. This leads to some odd phrasing that connect arguing with people. Attitudes and points of view are not private possessions at all in this perspective, but elements of text. Uh, the very term externalization acknowledges that there is a private internal character to argument which is being omitted from the theory. Uh, this, of course, is something which you know, virtue argumentation theory has, has certainly pushed back against, um, and, and share, we share in, in Dale Handel's uh, uh, response here. But this, in the context of the anonymity of arguments, this seems to raise a particular uh, uh, concern because if you're going to say uh, that effectively, I mean, effectively, what um, what uh, uh, Van Emer and Hürgendorf and lots of other not necessarily pragmatic people want to say about arguments is that they want to sort of strip away all the uh, identifying details as to where the argument comes from um, in order to evaluate it fairly. Well, effectively, they're making all arguments anonymous. But if, as we've just been discussing, there are reasons to be mistrustful of anonymous arguments, then essentially these people, uh, so if, you know, arguing anonymously is bad, and on the, the Van Emer and Hotendorst approach, then all arguments should be treated as though they were anonymous, then all arguments should be treated as though they were bad. And that, that doesn't seem good. Um, so that's uh, an initial worry. 
Um, I mean, one sort of, uh, you know, sort of further, I mean, the idea, as I say, is, a, is an old one, one sort of further uh, uh, way we can sort of push into this. Uh, you can push this all the way back to Aristotle, who dis distinguishes, uh, um, this is uh, um, Yanja uh, Zmavak, I think, uh, perhaps, um, uh, that uh, distinction between uh, a, a, an ethos that's manifested in the actual, uh, the actual talk, the actual speech or argument, and the broader prior ethos that the arguer brings to the, the conversation. So uh, the rhetorical ethos, as far as Aristotle is concerned, is just that which is manifest in, in what you actually say on that occasion. Um, but the rest of it, uh, well, the rest of it, Aristotle doesn't want to exclude, but he does regard it as being extrinsic to the art of rhetoric. It's not, not a rhetoric related point, although you might uh, make use of it or will need to counter it. Uh, so Ruth Amossi, uh, draws this distinction between what she calls a pragmatist ethos constructed within verbal interaction, purely internal to discourse, a sociologist ethos um, governed by social mechanisms and external institutional positions. Uh, so that encompasses the prior ethos. Uh, uh, so, uh, and yes, yeah, so in some cases, the speaker can heavily rely on the prior ethos. The speaker only has to confirm a pre existing image. Well, if the ethos is going your way, great. Uh, in other cases, the speaker has to erase aspects of his or her public image that might prove harmful. Uh, well, that raises a different complementary problem. So if the problem for the sort of mainstream of argument analysis is that they uh, risk making all arguments anonymous and therefore inheriting whatever difficulties anonymous arguments have, then a potential problem for virtue argumentation theorists uh, is that, that they are saying, well, um, that, uh, that, we, uh, that we, we take all arguments as, as having a uh, a necessary connection with the, the arguer, but then what do we do with anonymous arguments where we don't know what the connection to the arguer is, we don't know who the arguer is. So that seems to leave a hole in the virtue argumentation approach. Um, so uh, I want to say a little bit more about how that might be remedied, why it isn't as bad as one might think. So here's the basic uh, problem. Uh, virtue theories of argument treat character as relevant to the evaluation of arguments. Um, so then uh, how can we fairly assess uh, anonymous arguments if we don't know anything about the character of the person making the argument? Um, well, I suppose the first preliminary uh, um, sort of allaying of some possible concern is we're talking about argumentation character. We're not talking about the sort of full richness of biographical character. We don't necessarily need to know everything about, about the full uh, backstory and history of someone in order to evaluate their arguments. That would be a very strong claim. We're talking about the, the character that they manifest in the way that they argue. And they're manifesting some of that in this particular argument. So obviously one response, one possible way of doing, uh, presenting a virtue theory of argument would be to just, to, to just say, well, we're we going to ignore everything outside uh, this, particular, uh, um, this particular argument. We're not going to look at prior, uh, a prior track record, a prior ethos. Um, I mean, that you would still, you wouldn't be, this is not quite as self-denying as the Van Emeren Prutendorst approach, because you are at least looking at what the, uh, at the, the you are trying to extrapolate the character of the arguer in, on this occasion, um, but you're not looking at the past character of the arguer. Uh, so that would be one approach, but I don't think necessarily it's any approach, not necessarily uh, the best approach. So I think we can still uh, make use of an idea of track record and still make anonymous uh, arguments work with it. Well, obviously, a quick way of doing it is when they're not, they're any uh, partially anonymous, when they, there is an enduring pseudonym, as we were, I was talking a moment ago about the, 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 the law case example, uh, you, if somebody is well known under that name, even though it's not their, their government name, so to speak, uh, then you know, they can establish an ethos uh, with that particular uh, uh, pseudonym, that's that's not a problem. Um, we can we can keep track of that instead. But what do we do with the truly anonymous argument? Um, well, well, one thing we might say about it, as as Will Wilkin, Wilkinson suggests, is well, it, it it we take it less seriously. It commands less authority by virtue of us not really knowing where it came from, um, and that's you know that's a, a a trade off that has to be traded off against whatever benefit the arguer may receive from from being anonymous. They, they, where they lose out is that, well, uh, that we, we, to some degree, count that against them. Uh, I mean, there's a sort of broader problem here uh, that's, that's often a broader criticism that's a related criticism that's raised against virtue theories of argument, which is 
Uh, well, yes, what, what about bad people who make good points? Uh, what do we say? Um, so this is the sort of familiar meme from uh, the Onion spin-off uh, Clickhole uh, a few years ago. Uh, the worst person you know just made a great point. Um, is virtue argumentation, does, is this a problem for virtue argumentation? Are we saying that, that bad people can't make good points? Uh, well, no, we're not, I don't think. I hope we're not saying that. Uh, what we're saying is that when uh, uh, someone makes a, a good point, what makes it a good point is that they're making a the sort of point that a good arguer would make. Uh, so one would have trust that good arguers mostly make good points, but even bad arguers uh, can make good points from time to time. When they do so, they're arguing as a, as a virtuous arguer would argue. Um, so there is some possibility here for rescuing the idea of a, of a, a, a good point uh, in isolation from, from the person making it, and therefore recognizing good points, even when we don't know anything about the, the track record uh, of the person uh, making the point. But that sort of leads to uh, another problem here, which is whether we're setting up a system that is too permissive and could potentially be uh, exploited. So is there a possibility here for a sort of reputational laundering? Um, so might uh, arguers with bad track records benefit from anonymity? Uh, so someone who, whose arguments wouldn't be taken very seriously if you knew who they were, but they pop up as a, an anonymous or pseudonymous arguer uh, and therefore gain the benefit of the, of the doubt. How worried should we be uh, about that sort of thing? And I think, well, okay, at this point, this is, this is where I'm perhaps um, sketchiest, but my uh, uh, suggestion is we shouldn't be that worried. Um, so I mean, the first reason why we shouldn't be that worried is we should expect them, if they really are incorrigible, we expect their bad reputation to manifest itself soon enough. Uh, so sooner or later, out pops the cloven hoof uh, and, and they, they recover their, their bad reputation. Um, but uh, if they don't, on the other hand, if they succeed in turning over a new leaf uh, and actually arguing uh, convincingly and cogently, well, maybe we should welcome that. Um, so uh, so in that sense, at least, then their use of anonymity here is functioning as a way of making uh, others in other participants in the argument uh, respond to them more virtuously, rather than, uh, than, than responding with our preconceived assumption that they're going to give us a terrible argument. Uh, because we don't know who they are anymore, uh, we, we take them a little bit more seriously, and it turns out, well, that, that was, that was, uh, that was uh, rewarded, uh, that their actual arguments weren't so bad after all. So maybe we ought, perhaps, that the moral there is that we shouldn't be quite so swift to, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to count people out. Um, uh, there's a related point that was raised in that sort of roster of reasons why anonymous argument might be bad uh, was, uh, are anonymous arguments irresponsible? Uh, and again, I got a sort of somewhat uh, uh, fragmentary or sketchy response to this, but I think, broadly speaking, not necessarily. Uh, so, well, um, you know, certainly uh, uh, arguing anonymously might give you some uh, benefits, uh, some advantage in apparent cogency, but that's not necessarily blameworthy in itself um, uh, that you gain this, this little additional boost in, in your in, in ethos. Uh, if the argument that you're presenting is a, a bad argument, is a blameworthy argument at some level, um, then there's no reason why you shouldn't be blamed right now for making your bad arguments. The anonymity doesn't, doesn't block the, the blame. It blocks it from being associated with your uh, independent reputation. So you are, as it were, not staking your reputation on this argument. There's nobody knows who you are, so you don't know. Um, they're not, your, 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 your reputation is, is, is shielded from this, this particular argument that you're making. Um, but, uh, but you still get you know, you, you still in under whatever persona you're currently uh, presenting, uh, you get whatever blame. Um, well, if you get what you deserve, you get what you deserve. And uh, so it may succeed uh, in, in protecting you from uh, what is uh, sometimes called accountability. Uh, but the accountability here, well, that's uh, the ability of others to impose some sort of punishment on you. But then uh, at some level, that might be a reasonable thing. It's uh, um, not reasonable to expect uh, a, a sort of moral courage from arguers uh, um, uh, on all topics. Again, if we, if we do impose a requirement uh, uh, that people engaging with certain topics need 
supererogatory levels of moral courage, well, um, at least to present certain positions, what we're going to get is an impoverished range of, 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 of positions presented in that argument, which isn't clearly, you know, isn't necessarily to anyone's epistemic advantage. Well, maybe it's to somebody's, but it's not to the, uh, to the epistemic advantage of the, of the community as a whole. So uh, where does all this leave us? Uh, so we've seen that uh, disputes over the pros and cons of anonymous argument are not new. Uh, they certainly go back to uh, at least the middle years of the 19th century, well, and maybe quite a lot further than that. Um, uh, not all forms of anonymity give rise to the, the same problem. So some of the, uh, a lot of what gets talked about as an anonymity is probably pseudonymity, that we do have some sort of enduring pseudonym which can build up an ethos of its own. And much of the time we can work with that enough to, uh, to, to, to keep us on the road. Um, that there is uh, an ostensible problem for classic accounts of argument appraisal uh, that divorce arguments from arguers because, well, if anonymous arguments do have problems of some sort, then so do these accounts of argument appraisal because they're effectively treating all arguments as though they were anonymous. Uh, so virtue theories of argument solve that problem, but then they seem to have a different problem, um, as we've seen, that, uh, that, that, that perhaps they don't have anything to say about, about the genuinely anonymous arguments. Um, but I think that, well, as I've attempted to sort of sketch over the, uh, the, in the last few slides, that, that this is a, a challenge uh, which, uh, which can be met by virtue theories of argument, uh, that there are ways in which we can distinguish the good and the bad uses of, of anonymous arguing, uh, uh, just as we hope, hopefully can with, with more conventional forms of argument. So, uh, well, thank you very much. Um, thank you for your attention.